Claire. Hi, welcome to the Female Startup Club podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be talking to you today. Like I was telling you before we pressed record, I've been following your journey for a while. I'm such a fan of your Instagram. It speaks to my soul being so bright and bold and colorful. And for anyone who's watching on YouTube right now, you're sitting in this amazing room office full of your beautiful creations. Would you like to start by just giving us a little bit of an introduction to who you are and what your brand is? So my name is Claire. I'm originally from China. I lived in San Francisco about 10 years and I came here for uh, another second degree and uh, my background is in fashion marketing and uh, uh, development. Um, so after school, I kind of did a few freelance in different roles. Uh, I I was a photographer, stylist. I designed events for Bumble's Soho House and worked for retail a little bit. So kind of different roles in all in creative um, style related. And that kind of just gave me a overall concept of this is what I wanted to pursue. And also I realized there's common issues and the problems in the industry, no matter which one I'm in, it's either for the event industry or is it for a uh, photo shoot, is it for retails? I could not find these beautiful shapes that I can utilize either for my product photographies or with models or with events or simply just display product in the retail floor. That's kind of the concept come started because I was having a hard time to finding these pieces. And I tried to make it on my own from scratch, obviously living in the San Francisco, a tiny park apartment back then. It was a disaster try to cut woods, sanding and painting. Um, it was very labor intensive. So later on, when I had a little bit of budget, I was trying to hire a woodworker to help me. But, you know, leaving the big city, the day rate is like $500 for something small. So that I basically, at that point, I exhausted every, you know, possible solution. And yet I still cannot come up with a beautiful product that I wanted. So that's when the idea come from. Why don't I just start a company where I'm manufacturing these pieces where that is classic enough where I can utilize for a photo shoot. But after that, because we're all living in a very small apartment in the bigger city, I wanted to be able to utilize as a home decor piece after the shoot. So you don't have to have like huge warehouse storage, all these props pieces you've been collecting for an event for a shoots, where you can just use it in your apartment. So these pieces are uh, born with that idea, but yet um, I feel like it's good enough and build it a lasting for years to incorporating your home. So that's kind of the idea come from. As I was explaining, I love the word mood and I love the word atelier. So moodelier was born with a com combination of both. And I think that really speaks to my soul to be uh, piggy packing your, your sentence. Um, I think, uh, so that's basically the brand idea coming from, but during pandemic, uh, it really kind of kicked me on my butt because I was losing all the freelancing work at the beginning. So I had the idea back in 2019. So I was already did a lot of like re research and I did the samplings and stuff, stuff like that, registered the name. But really during pandemic was the moment makes me realize, oh, I really need to start this. Otherwise, I, you know, I will never be able to make it. And when I started and I realized I can't just provide it the beautiful tool, I have to give the knowledge back up the tools because as you and everybody else knows, just because you have a beautiful expensive piece of equipment that doesn't mean you make beautiful art. That's the idea of a course coming from where I can basically create a platform where I have these resources or I can reach out uh, other creators who are just so talented and amazing um, people where they can teach their creative process by maybe demonstrating my piece or uh, or not. That's kind of like an idea where I want to have a holistic approach, not just providing the tools for the creators, but also the knowledge of other creators who has already been there, done that. Oh my gosh, I love it so much. So cool. And I feel so like unique. I haven't seen anything like that on the internet and like kind of merging that physical product with the online digital course and resources 
for, you know, photographers or stylists or just creative entrepreneurs and product owners in general. How were you solving that manufacturing piece of the puzzle in the beginning? Like, how did you know what to do? Where did you start looking for people who could help you bring the product side of it to life? Totally. Um, I mean, as everybody knows, people just go on Alibaba and they're searching for a factory. But because this is such a huge pool, you really have to make sure at least talking to like a handful of a factory and compare um, how responsive they are. And then you kind of, it's a little bit of like a guessing tone at the beginning because you don't really know this person and you don't know if they are you know for real or if they're giving you misinformation so it's at the beginning stage when you do not have a relationship with any factories it is kind of hard to fine tune that perfect factory for you but that's just kind of how it is. Um, my suggestion is to talk with maybe at least three fa- different factories. And then, then you kind of have to do that, like a bouncing back and forth kind of dance and then talking to them and just kind of feel it, like trust your uh, gut, like when you talk to these people. And also to know that um, because they turn to, from my experiences, they turn to all over promising all the overseas factories. They say, oh, yes, I can do this. I can do that. That's easy. But when they actually start producing, then you start getting the samples and you realize, oh, this is not what they're promised. So you kind of have to have the buffer time building too. So especially when you are small, you don't have a huge budget and the resources on that. So it normally it takes longer time to develop a new product unless you're just going go on to Alibaba buying to the existing product from the manufacturer, which is I personally do not like to do that because A is not really ethical because somebody else designed that product and that now you're just ripping off. Um, uh, secondly, it's not original product. So that doesn't set you apart. So now uh, I've been doing this business for two years. When I first started, I did a whole ground research work. There's no brand exist. But since I started, obviously, anything is good is going to be copied after. So I see like a hands fall off uh, Instagram accounts trying to do photography props, which is not really exactly everything I do. Like I explained it, that my product is good. It's furniture grade and it's not only beautiful for props. So I see they trying to mimicking the product, but they didn't really get the deeper meaning behind it. And all the props are either basically built very low quality and they're very, very thin. So they don't really offering like a versatile usage where all my products is very thick. And uh, even like each size, you can display it in different way, right? Like you can do this way, you can do this way, you can do this way. So that's like, why my product is a little bit more premium and you you can use it in many different ways but imagine when you have a lower quality product they cannot do this thick of a product they just do like a little piece layer of this and the usage is very limited then because you you don't serve as like a platform anymore and also the quality is very low they don't really sand the surface really well it's really rough and so I see people are doing that, but because I actually designed and developed and find the factory all on my own, it took me over a year and a half to kind of finalize on some of these products. So then I, I know that they cannot never, they can copy it, but they cannot have exactly the same quality of the product. So that's another thing why I say I don't love the idea just go on alibaba sourcing the existing product if you really want to create a unique original product you really want to make a name of you for yourself i think designing and developing everything in house is the way to go obviously your products are large scale and they look really heavy what is the shipping kind of situation for you it seems like it would be tricky and expensive and I want to kind of talk about shipping but also kind of talk about like the financial side of shipping and this kind of piece of the puzzle yeah I love you asked that and I can tell you probably talked or or had experiences working with heavy product logistics then you 
That's exactly one of the hardest part of my business. That's why some people say they don't like the idea of、uh, doing a ecom for furnitures because the logistic part is hard. And then think of think about my product is essentially smaller scale furnitures. They are pretty bulky, heavy, and I sell everything in bundles. And the packaging is actually quite hard because all my products are in different shapes and everything's a small batch. So I. Do not have the capabilities actually creating mold for every single packaging like some other brands can offer. So the wrapping process is very hard, and sometimes the corner get damaged when the deliver guys is throwing the packages. So logistics and shipping is definitely a big hectic for me. For the longest time, I was shipping everything. From my factory in China directly to front door,、um, then the shipping was very expensive to start with. But and then pandemic hit, like everything raised, and shipping kind of like tripled as I started. So now I actually、uh, have a warehouse fulfillment center now in、um, Union City, California, to do all my U.S. domestic shipping. So that actually is a little. Bit easier for me now with all the U.S. shipping because it's faster and、uh, it is definitely lowered my cost、um, because shipping directly from China by airplane it it is insanely expensive. We're talking about like easily over a hundred dollars for shipping, and if you buying a larger pieces, that's like up to two hundred even more. Wow, it's so interesting because of course like. When you have D to C brands, you kind of think like I don't know everything's going to be kind of easy. But then if you have something that's breakable, or you have something that's you know glass or frozen or heavy like heavy big bulky products, you have to factor that in in the beginning of your thought process for building in your margins properly and kind of even I imagine the you know the startup capital that you needed, which is kind of leading me onto my next question. How much did you need to invest in that R and D process to even get your kind of original batch of samples and your first minimum order ready to launch? I think ready to launch was not that crazy. I probably, I probably did like twenty to thirty k max to kind of get everything going, not including branding, including like everything else. I think getting started is not the hardest part. To be able to. Operating, maintaining, and、uh, having a longevity of a business, running a sustainable business like this is actually quite hard because there is a capital, and then there's the inventory. You always have to, if you made money, have to put it back in. If you made money, you kind of like going on this like little rabbit hole、uh, as a business. So that's the part I think is a hard hard because you always have to reinvest back into your business. So that's why I. Feel like to for my business model because I have a partially digital, partially physical product. So those two pieces are kind of helping each other all at times. While the courses is not selling as well, the pieces are still selling, and sometimes the pieces are having a hard time with like supply chain or whatever. The courses helps a little bit. So I think having a business like this is. Helping me in a way that at least I don't have all my eggs in one basket. Even though I know like the physical part is actually harder to manage because there are just a lot of logistics to to manage. So I think it is definitely difficult to launch it. But I think actually operating it, running a sustainable business, is a harder than the launching part. Yeah. Absolutely, it's it's all about like the compound effect of over time and continuing to take that, you know, those small tiny steps, those small actions, and just not giving up. <laughs> Basically, when times get tough, because the journey is so long. I'd love to talk a little bit about specifically what you were doing in the lead up to your launch, how you went about launching, and kind of getting that initial. Batch of customers and true fans for the brand, and kind of you know that early phase of launching the brand. Yeah, the early part is really just me. I didn't have a whole a lot of, even though I have, I obviously have a background of marketing, but、I、didn't have a whole a lot of 
working experiences in marketing. So my strategy was because I have uh, some friends in the industry who are photographers and uh, I definitely contact them. And I also made a lot of DMs and basically collecting all my creators who can be part of my course. So that was part of my launching strategy where I utilized my networks and I knocked on a lot of strangers doors and talked to a lot of people and send them my product and talk to them the ideas potentially if they, we can all launch a course bundle together. So that was basically my go-to strategy when I started. I didn't have ads. I didn't have anything else. But I think I really just like bet on that one ideas or launching this course together that will give me some marketing exposures. What was the impact of that? Like, how did it go? Oh, it went really successful because when I launched my course, I think it was early 2020. And that's when everybody started thinking, oh, we're going to launch a course, we're going to launch a course. I think I acted fast. So when we first launched the course, there's not a whole a lot of a course coming out yet. Um, so that gave really good uh, impact and a lot of people purchased. So the launch was really successful as, you know, a single female founded company that is not VC back. And I also did not spend a lot of money into this. I think it was a very successful launch. I love that for you. Very cool. And I guess like for you as well, you came out with something that was so unique, looked really exciting, looked really different, was a different offering. So people, especially at that time when, you know, it wasn't so saturated, like you said, they were able to be like, wow, you know, I haven't seen something like this before. I really want to be part of this and part of this community and and learn from you. How did you kind of keep the momentum going? I know you said in the beginning you didn't run ads and you kind of were just you know, launching based on working with those um, creators and influencers and things like that. But how did you kind of continue to evolve your marketing strategy over that first year in business? Uh, I launched a second course towards the end of the year. And that one was really successful as well. And I grading my course quality and make it a different modules, make it a, you know, we have a PDF, we have worksheets. So I, every time I launch a new course, it's more upgraded than the other one. So that kind of continued going to the second half of 2020 and 2021. And also the product itself, I will say when I launched, there's obviously no, no other brand exists doing exactly the same thing. So I get so many DMs, good feedback, so oh, like this is what exactly I wanted and I couldn't find it. And thank you so much for, you know, creating this. And I got a lot of good feedback. So that kind of gave me a good, uh, like a momentum and a good mo- motivation to keep on going. I know I'm serving underserved groups and I'm solving a problem um, they need to be solved like myself because they say to find that founder market fit and I was that market and I, I, I was looking for my product. So I think because of that, the first year was doing really well because I have the good feedbacks and the momentums and I was doing more courses. Um, but later on, I did start running a little bit of ads. I think towards the end of the 2020, uh, when I launched the course, I tried ads. And back then, obviously, it's different world of Facebook ads and I was doing really well when I first tried with ads as well. Were you doing them yourself or did you kind of outsource to work with someone, a specialist? I outsourced uh, to another third party um, agency running Facebook ads. I mean, it's so crazy now, you know, how the landscape has changed now that iOS 14 updates came in and ads, the landscape just, you know, changed like crazy. But Have you tried, um, you know, going down the pathway of TikTok and what's been your experience with TikTok Spark ads and that kind of side of things? Are you, are you in that space? Oh, I, you know, I see your TikTok. I'm a huge consumer. (laughs) I'm on TikTok. I I shouldn't do this, but I'm on TikTok for hours every single day. Um, It's so good. It's so addictive. My God. (laughs) I'm obsessed. I know. I love your content on TikTok and I love you're talking about like different grind, different, you know, things you can apply. I love uh, what you're doing on TikTok. Uh, maybe this is something I could ask you for advice after the call. Uh, I definitely think TikTok is a must strategy for marketing. Um, but I haven't got a great like 
strategy or formula how to get more attractions on TikTok. Because like everybody says, so far the basically what I create on Reels, I try to repurpose on TikTok, it's just not working exactly the same. So I haven't found my perfect film formula and a strategy on TikTok yet, but I definitely think it's a must uh, marketing channel and it's cheapest. If you want to buy into a uh, buy ads on TikTok, it's definitely uh, the cost of click through is definitely lower than um, Instagram, Facebook, but overall, it, it is definitely a great, great platform. I just haven't found my exactly strategy on that channel yet. I'm still trying testing a few things. Yeah. But maybe I'll ask you after the call, <laughs> what is your thoughts and advice? Oh my gosh, I'm I'm on it. I would be so happy to help you. Of course, I can give you any tips. I haven't personally used the like TikTok Spark kind of platform yet. So I really, I'm not even familiar with what it looks like, to be honest. But I keep hearing people talking about, you know, the switch from Facebook ads and Instagram ads and now moving to kind of the TikTok ad space, which is quite lucrative and driving a lot of traffic. So I'm, I was interested to know whether you'd explored that at all. I have talked to, to somebody who... Um are running ads for TikTok. So my overall feedback is exactly what you said. It's a lot more, the conversion rate is not as good as like the click through rate or driving traffic, but it is really easy for people to gain exposure, like kind of getting the traffic on the website, whether or not they're buying is another story, but it's really good to gain the exposure. That's sort of what I heard from strategists. What's like working for you now in your marketing mix kind of, you know, in 2022 with the different changes in the landscapes and the platforms and everything? What are you kind of focused on? It's so interesting that I am uh, definitely trying different things because TikTok is one thing I wanted to figure it out and I'm trying to create reels like everybody else, which... I feel like 2022 is just completely a whole new year for all the e-coms because everything you have been doing for the last two years is no longer working and no longer serving. So you have to, all of a sudden, you have to come up with brand new guidebook for your brand. So I am in that stage of I'm trying to figure out what is my new strategy. Before I have like pretty good system going um, 2020, 2021, but this year's obviously it's no longer working. So I am in the process of uh, figuring out what is my new system. Um, so obviously trying reels, so short form video content, but another strategy is actually going to more in-person events like a trade shows, markets, to expose myself with real people, um, not like on the internet, like off the internet people and then they can actually see touch feel my product and then realize oh this is good quality because a lot of stuff on the internet you can't really touch and feel and see especially with my type of product if you're a photographer you'll see oh it's like kind of expensive I don't I don't know maybe I would just buy it from the other brands who has like a maybe similar stuff but they don't see the quality in person so they don't understand what they're missing out so and uh, one of the strategies going to different trade shows different markets just see people in person uh, and another on top of that another one is having distributors before 2020 one, I've never thought about distributors, but since last year, I'm thinking about distributors or having my having another party to carry my product. Or if they have a larger platform, and obviously that's good exposure for me. So right now, we just got Design Milk Shop. So that's a, a big platform. I think uh, it's going to be good for us marketing-wise. And I'm trying to get boarding process. And also, I am changing my shop it's really funny to say because most of the e shop is on Shopify, but my shop is actually created on Webflow. So now I'm in the uh, transition for moving my shop on Shopify. I think after that, a lot of those third-party vendor integrations is going to just be so easy for me. So I'm going to do more of this like third-party marketplace 
like onboarding my brand to their their places. So I think that's my number two strategy. One is in person, then the second one is get, uh, getting more distributors. Mm, yeah, I can see how well like your products would work being in person and in cool stores and cool retailers and kind of surrounded by other cool products too. When you say that you were on Webflow and you're moving to Shopify, when like I think about starting a D2C brand, I immediately go to Shopify. Like there's no other option in my mind. And anyone who ever asks me, I'm like, oh, there's just no other person, uh, no other company. You need to go to Shopify. But for you, what was the decision making process to going to Webflow? And then what made you choose to actually switch over to Shopify? Uh, when I first started, everybody is telling me um, to design a fully customize the Shopify store. It's going to be super expensive. And uh, when I started, I have no money to really invest it in the 20K or like 10K even website. So the decision was basically, I want a beautiful website, but I want to do it for cheap. And Webflow was the <laughs> option for me. But as I grow, like I reinvested in a lot of money to customize the platform. but I think since last year and then realized I'm being hitting on so many walls because Webflow is not a great platform, but it's, as you said, it's definitely not built for e-com. I was hoping as my shop grow, their platform sh- should be grow as well for being more intuitive for uh, e-com like mine, but they didn't really grow in that part. So now my shop has grown. I need a lot of different integrations and the it's just they're not viable. Even with the new Facebook uh, KPI for ads, it was also not good integration either. I was on a call with their support for like hours and we didn't even end up figured out a solution for the new KPI for Facebook ads. So I'm just completely bummed out because I did spend a lot of energy, time and money um, build my current platform. But I also realized I cannot no longer grow on that platform and I do have to 100% switch the platform in order to grow more. I'm just losing on sales to stay in that platform. So that's the decision I made, even, even though it was kind of sad, but I was very firm. I was like, it's time. It doesn't matter how much money, time, effort I put into that platform. There's no longer serving me. There's no point for me to still holding on that so now we're going to move completely to Shopify by the end of uh, next month August I'm really excited about it (laughs) gosh exciting yeah (laughs) I can see it in your face you look really excited so today's episode is actually brought to us and powered by our lovely friends at Norby so I want to have a quick chat about them and to see like how you're using them what it helps you with what the impact has been and just your overall kind of thoughts on Norby? Yeah. Um, I first saw Norby is obviously through Bulletin. Uh, I see they have this beautiful linking bio page. I'm like, oh, that's really cool. Because before that, it was all kind of ugly. And I, I, I do like the design aspect. So first, it was attractiveness is because the aesthetic, I'm not going to lie. And uh, as I looked into more, I'm like, oh, they're using this new thing called Norby. And then I I think I probably send a demo request at that point. Um, and then I'm also a believer, a supporter of uh, new uh, things coming out and like to test it out and try it. So that part of me is like, oh, I wanted to try this new, give it a try for this new platform. And as I was onboarding, I realized it's much more than just like linking bio kind of thing. It's more of a marketing. Um, they're trying to build a your know, go-to marketing platform where is text message and the sign up forms and the collecting monies and email marketing, which is kind of fascinates me how fast and they're able to build all of that because I know they when I signed up for it, they only started like maybe six months ago. So so far I really enjoy using Norby um because it just it's something uh I don't see anybody else is re- really doing per se. It get a like, good combination of you can create a separate landing page if you want. For example, I did a West Coast Craft is Market a place in person a couple months ago, and I need to create a landing page to 
uh, basically opt in the people who see my product and want a little like discount code. So I printed out all these uh, Q uh, posters and in the back, I have a QR code and I tell people get 10% off if you sign up. And I need a landing page, opt-in page for people's numbers and emails. So that one, I used Norby to create that landing page and it was really beautiful. And then I created it in like two minutes. Um, so I think things like that, Norby is really, really good. If you want to just build a multiple like opt-in forms, multiple landing page or sign up page, create new events. Uh, it's really great, especially they're helping you to collecting the phone numbers, which is another marketing thing. I, I forgot to say in 2022, everybody should uh, incorporating the text message as their part of their marketing strategy on top of like the email marketing, existing email marketing strategy. So far, I really enjoy do, uh, using Norby. And I think I'm going to this year, I'm going to push myself to do more text messages fully utilize what I've been built up to. Me too. I have that as one of my goals and, and Norby's actually helping me with this idea that we're bringing to life. It's called the Hype Girl Hotline because my book is called Your Hype Girl. And so we're doing the Hype Girl Hotline and you can basically text this number and kind of or sign up to receive our text and we're going to send out like Monday motivation and kind of like have a bit of a chat line going on, which I'm super excited about. But my goal is also to kind of like start slowly dipping my toe in the the text message side of marketing, which I haven't done before. It's totally new to me. So I'm very excited. Shout out to Norby. Shout out to the founder, Sam. She is such an amazing woman. I just also love everyone that works at Norby. They're so cool. <laughs> yes. Yes, totally. What is next? What's coming up for you that you want to shout about? What's new? What's exciting? Where can people come and find you in real life? Tell me everything. So in real life, we're doing unique market in LA, uh, August 13 and 14, two days the weekend. So that's coming up. I'm really excited and I love the founder of Unique Market, also Asian female. And she's been doing that for over 10 years now, uh, which is really impressive. So that's my next uh, in-person event. And after that, I have West Coast craft winter in San Francisco back in that big indoor place. That one is really, really good and I'm really excited about. And one thing I'm not really happy about all these in-person events is because my background is actually doing events like this, maybe not like a marketplace, but I love the hands-on tactical, like using my hands to build things, display things and real space, not just on the internet. So that part actually pumps me up a lot whenever I do that and gives me a lot of joy and motivations to do something even more for my brand. So I'm really excited about these events in person and uh, coming up, uh, we're switching to Shopify. So it's going to give a enhanced, uh, fresh look. So it's not going to be exactly the same look like Modelier.com today. But it's still going to have the Moodle DNA. We still have the same color palette, but it's, everything's going to be refreshed. The landing page, I just saw the design this morning. I was really excited. And it's a scrolling landing page instead of our mysterious landing page. And then it has more information. It just overall is more user friend flow. Uh, so that's coming up towards the end of August. I'm really excited about. And I just launched um, Moodle at home a few months ago where I'm offering like larger scale pieces and I'm pre-ordering these bubbly mirrors behind me. Uh, I'm really excited about the mirrors for the physical product. And I'm also launching a new course in September 1st. That's all about styling. So it's Moodle st styling course bundle. I have five amazing creators. I have got some all time favorite creators already created a course in the past with me. I have a few new ones. Um, I'm really excited about. So that's pretty much it. Oh my gosh. So many cool things. That's pretty much it. You've got so many great things going on. Oh my gosh. That sounds so cool. I'm so excited for you. Wow. Good luck for the market too. Sounds really fun. Thank you so much. What is your best piece of advice for early stage founders who are just starting out and launching a brand 
as a bootstrapped company? Ah, that's a great, great question. I think right now, if you're launching a brand today, definitely figure out a strategy on TikTok because that's gonna be zero cost, you know. Because I literally had this conversation. I also use another tool called Use uh, Use Intro, which you can talk to basically all the experts on that. So last week I talked to the CMO of Rare Beauty, you know, Rare Beauty founded by Selena Go- Gomez. So I talked to her and then she, that's one piece of advice she gave it to me. She's like, you know, I, I asked during recession 2022, like a bootstrapped a company like me, obviously we need to cut a lot of costs. What is one piece of advice? Uh, she can give it to me for the, basically marketing. And she, she said, fully utilize TikTok because it's zero cost. You don't even have to buy ads and it's, it's still going on pretty strong. I don't know what it's going to look like next year. And then she said, post us three videos, seven, seven seconds on TikTok every single day. <laughs> so I, I will, I will say the same. Oh my gosh, three a day. <laughs> Three a day is so many. I've heard people posting 10 to 20 a day. It's true. I've heard, um, I had Nadia Okamoto on the show and she posts 50 times a day. And I'm always just like, what? That's crazy. She's amazing. It's so crazy. I mean, she has 3.3 million followers now, so it it really worked for her. (laughs) But it's crazy. 50 times, yes. (laughs) I'll try. I'll stick with maybe one for now. (laughs) Yeah, one is good. I do one. So at the end of every episode, we ask a series of six quick questions, some of which we might have already asked, some of which we might not have, but I ask them all the same. So question number one is, what's your why? Why are you doing this every single day? Because I'm so passionate about what I'm doing. That's why. And it's my first company. Obviously, I got really personally really attached and that's good and also bad. Just I'm really passionate about and I really believe in what I'm doing. Amazing. Question number two is what has been your favorite marketing moment so far? I think when I tried to launch the course bundle, that was my favorite marketing moment and it really worked and I got really great feedback love that for you question number three is what is your go-to business resource when it comes to a book or a newsletter or um, a podcast I don't have a one book I really enjoyed reading um, a couple years ago building a brand story that's a really good book for building a brand and it really helps you with messaging that's a really good resource for me. And today I feel like there are just so many resources out there. Honestly, I feel like a TikTok is really good one. That's where I discovered your TikTok. I discovered you sharing all these like a grant and like all these resources. So I don't really have a go-to one. I feel like a lot of us these days don't have just one hub, one place. We're kind of jumping around. Yeah. So I don't know if that's a good answer, but I do like TikTok. It's a great answer. I love TikTok too. I follow a lot of the cool. I uh, I also just bookmark it. If I find out something really interesting, I don't have a time to like fully digest or dig into that resources they're provided. I just bookmark it. And later on, I go back to. 100% me too. I do the same. Question number four is how do you win the day? What are your AM or PM rituals and habits that keep you feeling happy and successful? Uh, in the morning, I don't know if this is a good habit. I always have a coffee in the morning and I have a little Pomeranian and oh my god your dog is so cute I have to tell you I forgot to tell you already I have a little dog too and hazelnut is like warms my heart I love her she's so cute what is your dog's name uh my dog is she's a little chihuahua and she is called sweetie sweetie (laughs) what a sweetie pie (laughs) I love that yeah yeah. <laughs> so I feel like you probably feel the same. Like whenever you come back to home or w- waking up in the morning, they just jumps on you and then greeting you and then licking you. That's just like a good five minutes for me. And I needed that every morning to wake up. Going uh, going to sleep is not good. Right now it's just TikTok. I don't recommend <laughs> to going to sleep with TikTok. But that's yeah something I needed to change. Um, yeah, but that's kind of my simple routines. I don't... 
I uh, one thing I wish I develop a workout in the morning routine, but I currently don't do not have, and that's just what it is. That's just what it is. Hey, I mean, one step at a time. You've got the dog kisses. That's the best ever. That's all you need. It's again also my like favorite part of the day is like the mornings and giving her little snuggles and stuff. She's so cute. Question number five is what's been your biggest money mistake and how much did it cost you? Money mistake. I think maybe launching product that is not ready for your audience. That was my mistake cost me maybe I would say 10 grand. I think I launched um, some digital product that was not really, my audience not really ready. And I think they, in my head, of mine, this is a really good idea, I think. But I didn't really test it out. I didn't really like do more uh, researching before. And I just like kind of la- launched it. I feel like that's something they were not ready for probably was my biggest mistake but even that I feel like it's okay because like the digital product I can still utilize their photos um yeah so it, it's it, it is a mistake but it's a good mistake yeah absolutely learning comes from those mistakes <laughs> and question number six last question what is just a crazy story good or bad that you can share from this journey of building a business I think maybe it's not when I was building the company it's obviously I said it because I was passionate about my product and I, I think it's a great idea but really before that makes me really wanted not working for anybody anymore for the next couple of years was my previous job really made me realize I can do this. And I feel like if I'm going to busting my ass off for somebody else, I may try that for my own company. Yeah. So that's kind of really big, like moment of waking up moment for me to really want to having the idea of having my own company. 100%. So true. So true. <laughs> Claire, this was so fun. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me on the show today and share all of your learnings and your cool journey in Moodlier. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure and I'm so honored to be part of your family and I can't wait to see what else is coming for you this this year and next. I'm excited for you.